Again, Pastor Paul Adeferasin speaks on corruption in Nigeria, questions the census figures and calls INEC a fraud. And the House of Representatives considers a bill to make the president and governors lose their positions after the defection. Well, this is Plus Politics, and I am Mary Anacol. Paula De Farassin, the senior pastor of the House on the Rock Church, has spoken on the various challenges of the country. The prelate referred to the Electoral Commission as a fraud, saying that the number of citizens leaving in the North is incorrect. He also called Lord Lugard, who amalgamated North and South in Nigeria in 1914, evil. On the way forward, he said it is important to educate the citizenry, encouraging people to get their voters card and of course, a political party card. Joining us to discuss this is Alester Wilcox. He's a political analyst. Enor Ugbevere, she is a broadcast journalist. And we also have Kunle Lawa. He is a public affairs analyst. We'll take a short break to bring you that video of Pastor Paula De Faras. And then when we return, we'll be talking. By the way, if we don't fix some of Nigeria's problems today, that is this INEC problem. I will say it plainly, INEC, Put me in trouble if you like. It is a fraud. The numbers in Nigeria, as far as census are concerned, and as far as election is concerned, are a lie. And if nobody will speak up about it, the righteous should speak. The numbers are, are not properly reflected in our voting. This is the only country in West Africa where you move from the ocean to the desert and the numbers decrease, or rather, they increase. The only country, it's the only country in the world where you move from a large body of water to little or no water and the numbers increase. It was not Nigerians that started it. It was the parents of Nigeria who were not good parents. They were not good parents. The, the man, Lord Lugard, was a, a devil incarnate. And what he did to this country, we're suffering it many years later and it's time that we must tell the truth. The country deserves people like you. Because people exactly the opposite of you are the people ruling the country. And from the wards, they're the ones who select their governors, they select their House of Representatives, they select their senators, they select their congressmen, and they select the president. It's a party system. If you're not in the party, you do not affect the system. I can't get a party card. You know why? Because they are APC here, they are PDP here, and we can't tell the difference because they say the blood of one washes the others free from their sins. What kind of stupid, stupidness is that? That politicians are allowed to cross carpet and accept it as they see that one governor washed all his crimes away in the blood of ape. I said the blood of ape. I didn't say anything else but that one. Part of my job is to make sure that the wealth of Nigeria is redistributed with an evenness. How do you do it? Not by giving the poor rice and oil at election time. Give them an education. And education in today's age does not have to be formal. Well, that is um, a clip, a clip from, um, you know, the long message that was preached by Paul, Pastor Paul Adi first. And this is not the first time he's talking about this, but I want to start with you, Kunle, because he talks about the numbers um, that is generated from our census. And of course, he talks about INEC being a fraud. Now, you are of the Electoral College and you are one of those people who are advocating for free, fair and credible elections. What are your thoughts on this, especially because it's coming from a pulpit and not necessarily the normal voter education that we would be expecting? Uh, I think first I'd like to address um, his um, position on INEC before the census. So as long as we have the president appointing the INEC chairman, the INEC is never going to be independent. And this is because for independence, INEC needs to be able to appoint itself either from within its, its ranks or as the justice, uh, the Ministry of Justice, it will be passed under the Ministry of Justice, and then you have people that would select that's high court judges. As regards um, the census, um, it's a long time in Nigeria, census has been, has been done, and um, 
not only the North has falsified numbers, even the South has falsified numbers. So it's an across-board thing. And they falsified based on the fight and scramble for Nigeria's resources. So, of course, because Nigeria also does not have a computerized database system to keep um, our numbers, we have, of course, falsified a lot of things across board. And this is the problem. We do not have, it's like we're planning for dinner and we don't know how many people we're cooking for. Mm. That's the exact problem. And now, let me come to you. Um, I know that uh, as a journalist, you know, it behoves upon us to get data, get information that is factual such that we can make reference to. But Kunle here is saying that we have falsified numbers across the country. Not, it's not just a North or a Southern problem. It's a you know, nationwide problem. But let, let me just take you back to 2013. Um, the NPC boss uh, under the Good Luck Jonathan administration, Professor Zodumegu, he spoke about the, um, the, the population census in Nigeria. And he did say that um, you know, the country has not had any credible census since 1816. And here we are, we keep making reference to the fact that Nigeria has um, 200 plus million. And this has been the same number over the years. Where do you stand on this, especially if you have to give information as regards the number of people in different places? Uh, do you support what Pastor Paul is saying or do you have a different standpoint? Okay, so I think that first of all, um, blaming INEC is, I mean, it's out of place because it's not INEC's responsibility to count or to provide census uh, figures uh, for the country. There is a body whose job it is to do that. And it's very instructive that politicians get into power. They have these numbers put up. Um, I don't know how they come about the figures, but like you said, if we indeed have the census that someone says is, um, I mean, hasn't happened in many, many years, where then do we get the numbers? But then again, uh, we have a voter registration process. We have a voter register. Uh, if that is what INEC has, then that is what INEC will work with. And then again, over time, why have the politicians or the political class, or even civil society, not pushed for um, a census to be done? You know, I mean, with the unrest and the violence in the, in the Northeast and other parts of the country, you could say, okay, they, they have a, I mean, right now they have an excuse, but, you know, Time was maybe four, five, six, seven, eight years ago when it was possible to conduct a census. So if we don't have the figures, really, what are we doing? Then it becomes a fraud. But I don't think it's an INEC problem. It is a, a national problem, a system problem. Nobody wants to fix it because if you fix it, then you're going to take away fraud, primarily, you know, and a lot of corruption that goes on. Because if you say what well, to 5,000 people, we want to see data. So if we don't have the data, then, you know, you can do all sorts of shady things. But once you have data, then a lot of the rubbish that goes on in Nigeria cannot happen. And that's what they are preventing, the political... Hmm. Okay, people, let me... Let's say civil society and, you know, other people have sort of enabled them to do this and get away with it. When you say we've enabled, how have we enabled? Because being an enabler means that you create... But how have we as Nigerians enabled this to continue to fester? So, so first of all, if we go back to the voting um, process and the voting day, um, I mean, many times the figures that they give, there's always a contest. For me, that, that is very disturbing that you'll be somewhere, you would see maybe 200 people, and then when the results come out, it's much more than that. Or people really don't come out, you know, but when the figures are announced they're much more than you know those that were there and people haven't said no we need to cancel that i mean some of the conversations we have around the elections and the processes should contain those kinds of conversations you know those kinds of calls and then again um if census is not happening and those that should push for it because if the political class are then they're, not, they're never going to push for it so those that can are we doing what we Beating our voices enough? Are we making those calls? Are we making those demands enough? So if we're not raising our voices to say we want this, we demand this, or nothing's, I mean, they could say we're not going to come out to, to vote if we don't have, you know, census. I mean, we could have done that maybe 12 years ago or, or earlier than that. But if we look the other way and say, well, you know, we're enabling them. Huh. Let me go to you, um, Alastair. Now, Pastor Paula Dave Harrison went on, and I would like to quote him directly, uh, to blame the irregularity of distribution 
or distortion, I beg your pardon, and falsification of figures for selfish reasons, which Enor has uh, pointed out. Um, he said, and politicians have given all sorts of reasons for these distortions and falsifications. And he has said also that um, there's been an outrage from the North. Um, you know, every time issues of census is brought up. I remember that one of the reasons why Festus Odomego was asked to resign was because um, there were reactions to what he said. And of course, a certain Norseness did not like the idea. I mean, there were several reports as to why he resigned or why he was asked to step down. But if we as a country do not necessarily, um, like Enor said, put our acts together and try to, you know, get these politicians to do right by us, why should we be complaining in the first instance, like Pastor Paul? Well, thank you. Um, thank you for having me. Uh, and I want to thank the two, my two colleagues on the platform. I think uh, we're going to have a nationalistic uh, discussion this evening, which is that fine to me. Uh, I, will have, I will have clapped for, uh, for Pastor Paul Adeforazin if he has not made those uh, tribal and the sectional comments. I mean, as seen targeting the North as his basis of his whatever someone. I think this Nigerian... Um, I mean, this merchandise of Nigeria, Nigerian project, is taking a lot of people too far beyond their calling. Uh, if if uh, Pastor Paul Adefrasi has talked about the Nigerian woes rather than um, targeting the North as his, uh, as his target of his uh, anger, I think he would have made a very good sense, but I think he failed it at that point, and I'm giving a thumbs down. My other colleague has talked about it in terms of <coughs> falsification of, um, of, of data in Nigeria. Of course, like my colleague, it's an across-board thing. Uh, we were not born when 1916, when census started in the country, we were not born. And Pastor Jeffrey was not born, and uh, 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 he has a father that he was a chief judge that lived through this system, and, ben and they all benefited from the system. So if then they didn't complain with all the anomalies of the system, and they didn't put their foot down as to do what was right, so now, beginning to, because of the today merchandisation of Nigeria, and everyone wants to be play to the gallery and play the, and, and, and play the populist game. People now target the North as the problem of Nigeria. I'm from River State, and we know what election is in River State. I, am, I will not shy away from saying this. Rivers, Aqua Ibom, Delta, Bayelsa, they are the eyes the, 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 the of evil in terms of election in Nigeria. You, you, you grew up in Potako, you know what happened in Potako. There will not be election, you hear gunshots, at the end of the day, you hear humongous figures that will be ruled out. Hmm. Humongous figures. Under, under Pito Dili, I mean, it was, it was sea slide, moon slide victories. But each time people talk about the election, they talk only about Kanu. And so we're not addressing the issue. We hide our own scene, we hide what we do down south here, we cover ourselves. The, the southern dominated press will always focus on what happened in Kanu, what happened in Sokoto. Look, in 1983, I was, I was young, but I knew. When Sokoto Resort comes, it has always been like that. When Sokoto Resort comes, it overshadowed all that happened in the entire southeast. And so that has continued till today. And if Pastor Paul is telling the world that he does not know why the North is populated, I will tell him why the North is populated. I will tell him why. In the North, at age 13, you start, you start bearing children. 12, 13, you start bearing children. In South, down South, you don't. How many people bear children at 13, 15? How many girls? In the North, you marry six wives, four wives. In the South, you marry only one. Mm -hmm. And then you keep your children to grow, which is, the, which is the good thing we do. So why would they not be populated? In the south, we are more Christian. There are more Christians in the south than in the north. In the south, we believe in one wife, one man, one wife, and you believe in counseling and all those things. They don't believe so in the north. In the north, they believe in progression. So they, they, they overpopulate. The population in the north okay. is it cannot be compared with that of the south. So if him, a educated, well-traveled man, does not know this basic fact, you talked about the majorities. Where do they come from? How, how do they? How, how do they? Is, is there also a lie? You talked about about. Uh, Early pregnancies and, uh, and and teenage pregnancies and marriages. Where does your come? It's not in the north. So this is the limitation of the north. And if Pastor Francis will claim he doesn't know, there's something is wrong. That is either he's hiding, okay. he's not, he's not being true to his calling. Okay. He should be able to tell the truth. If he says he wants to tell the truth, then speak the truth in in its entirety. Okay, don't let's start. Party. I'm coming. Don't target a, a, a party. When 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 Jonathan starts, when Jonathan when, when Jonathan starts to uh, to make like you said, what Jonathan is not, is not an eye. He was a starter. Was, was a starter. Why was he sacked? 
So sometimes you blame the wrong people for your problem. And okay. turn it on the guy. All right, Alistair, we'll come back to you. I, I think uh, Kunle wants to... Kunle wants to Kunle wants to butt in. Uh, Alistair, hold on, hold on. We'll get back to you. Um, Kunle, you want to butt in. I um, see that you were... Um, there's, you see, um, whenever we have this conversation, I'd like to stay away from the northern and southern rhetoric. Well, I think he was making mention of something he heard in yes, the video. Yes, no, no. I know he heard that in the video. And that's why I also didn't give uh, Paul uh, Adifarasin's statement a little credence to continue the north and south dragging. There was something he mentioned, which is a common narrative which points to um, um, Nigeria and the constitution as regards Lord Lugard. Now, Lord Lugard and the British left the country, left Nigeria in 1960. By 1963, we're fully clear of them with our, with our constitution, our first constitution. Following then, over the last 20 years, even coming into this democratic dispensation, I don't know how everybody has absorbed the National Assembly from the 1999 constitution. If you look at countries like the US, between 1999 and present, they've made more than 4,200 amendments to their constitution. Is it because Paul Adifarasin doesn't want to mention members of his congregation who are in the National Assembly? Because it is key that even the fact we don't have a census, even if the president doesn't want a census, the National Assembly, with the act that empowers it, has the power to push a census. The National Assembly has, a, has the power to create a constitution that's favorable. I don't know why nobody is pointing in their direction. They seem to be so aloof with it. And especially the National Assembly, they need to say government like they are citizens. Everybody just seems to absorb them of their own responsibility, which is not constituency projects, which is also not provided by the constitution. So constituency projects is a direct anomaly of what they're supposed to do. For me, Nigeria's problem is the National Assembly. If we do not get the National Assembly right, we cannot have a country. Let me, you know, he, uh, Pastor Paul mostly talks about education, and I think that was the last thing that was in that video. He talked about education. He talked about infrastructure development. Uh, he says that, I'd like to quote him, that it is deliberate that education was killed somewhat in the South, in the North. He's literally talking about the whole country, that it was a deliberate tactics um that now mm -hmm. all, if you want to access good education you need to be able to afford a private education um for you to be able to get something that is as close as good education but then he's saying that why can't our leaders invest in education because he thinks that if we are educated then we would be able to ask the right questions so I i'm putting this to you again we have SDG goals uh, that we're supposed to meet as a country. We haven't even scratched the surface. We look at our budget and the monies that are earmarked for education is it's like a drop in the bucket. Um, could he be right that maybe this is a deliberate attempt or could it be that we, maybe we as a people do not necessarily prioritize education as much? Uh, he's correct. And um, you know how suddenly we the people have accepted you know that narrative that has been pushed by the political class i mean if nigerians know we will make more demands most of the things that happen will not happen and even the things that do happen they won't happen the way they should do you understand so what they have done and you know i've i've, I've thought about this they killed uh, elementary school, they make um, tertiary education almost impossible. I mean, it's deliberate. I mean, there's there's no other way to say it. it's actually very calculated. Because if they say that, that education is not important, then you want to ask, why are their children studying abroad? Why is it that those that are in Nigeria are in schools that you pay seven digits? Why? know why if it's not important if healthcare is not important for example why do you need to fly abroad to get treatment if it is not important why are you making sure that your children benefit have good education the best with taxpayers money aha uh -huh. do you understand so they know what they're doing and you know with this miseducation so it's not just the lack of education when they pretend to educate they miseducate the people so we have people saying, oh, like, for example, in rural states, I work on radio and you hear people say, oh, it's Buhari. Everything is Buhari. 
Then I asked them, um, so River State has been, you know, a state for how many years now? How many Northerners have sat in your state assembly? Nobody will answer. How many Northerners have sat as governors? Nobody will answer. How many Northerners have represented you at the assembly, you know, national assembly? Nobody will answer. So how is it that the North of Buhari is your problem? So there is the miseducation part of it. And that is where the politicians go hard. They make sure that the people are blinded to the basic things that they are supposed to provide and just create all this. When I hear people say there's religious, I don't know what they call it, there's bias. There's no bias anywhere. It's what they're trading. And the people are buying it because they are miseducating people, you know, deliberately. I mean, look at the NSAS protest, for example. The church was there. The mosque was there. People were there. And everybody was all right. So where is the division that they preach or they talk about? Politicians come and they, they want to divide. I mean, that's, that's part of their miseducation plan. They always come up with that division. Oh, along ethnic, religious, political, it's all rubbish. Mm. And we ask the question all the time, why is that they don't quarrel among themselves? When it's time to buy new cars for themselves, when it's time to have the good life, on tax, fears, blood and money, they're together. It's beautiful. Nigeria is okay. But when it starts to touch them, then they say, oh, the people need to understand. The people need to make sacrifices. So, yes, they have killed education. And, and you know, it pains me that when, when you hear callers on radio, nobody's even talking about it. I heard the state governor a few days ago saying, I provided 17,000 desks and chairs for primary schools. And one question I asked was, how many primary schools do we have? So that the person can boldly say, it's only 17,000. I don't understand. That's, so, so what are we doing? So we're, what we're doing is this, and I was telling someone a few days ago, what we're doing, especially in a state like River State, is that we're setting the state backwards in like 50 years. Because if there's no education, and the young people here see that militancy works, aggression works, that's the path they're going to follow religiously. And they cannot understand because that's the model they see. And it's working, it's effective. You work hard as a militant, whatever it is that you do, you break the law, you're able to shoot people, you're able to hit a gangster, terrorize people, then the next something, maybe a councillor, local government chairman, you get into the House Assembly, then you know you become a maybe traditional ruler or something. So that's what they're doing. They know what they're doing and it's deliberate. So I think it, it, it's important that political parties do the right thing. And then we have what they call NOA. I don't know what they're doing. I don't know what they're doing. Please don't I don't get, know. Don't, and I, I think don't also, get us started. Please, please. Let's not go there. Mm -mm. Let, don't get us started on NOA. That's a different conversation on no, another so they, day. No, no, Mary, it's for another Mary, day. They are not funded. They are not funded. That's it. But, they, but, they, but do they, would, but do they, that, but do they earn a salary every month? They, uh, do their bosses get some form yeah, of impress? So, so yeah, they, so, they, so, they, so it's, I'm it's sure like, that like they're, I'm sure that they're included in the budget every other month. You know, so where do does the money, the money go? Well, that's do why I said it's a money? conversation for another day. But because we're yeah, out, of, because is, we do not have a lot of time, I think that we can also help them because if people know better, they will do better. Do you understand? Mm -hmm. So if civil society, for example, you know, and other private individuals can say, let's fund NOA, you know, let's support them, let's have these town halls and let them come and talk to people. And they drag people in with some incentives, maybe lunch or something, mm -hmm. so that they start to hear the truth. Okay. And until we do that, until we deliberately start to educate people, my dream is not going to go anywhere. There's no amount of anything that's going to happen, no amount of elections, no amount of, nothing will work. Until okay. the people are educated. Maybe, and if we're maybe, killing maybe, schools, maybe you and we're I should killing stand... secondary schools, we've killed universities, then what is it that we have? Nothing. Maybe it's we need maybe exam. we need to start a GoFundMe for NOA. But unless that my my last question is to you because we're almost out of time. Um Pastor Paula De Farrison talked about the fact that we are living on a false or a false hope of sorts, that we think that our country is rich. And he went ahead to say we are poor, we're debt poor as a country, that we keep deceiving ourselves that we are a rich nation, but that we're debt poor. Uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm thinking to myself, we know that we've been in and out of recession. The Naira, I always keep saying, has taken a deep dive. I mean, literally, our money doesn't have any standing uh, side by side with, you know, the dollar or the pound sterling. So um, we're, we're, we're facing a very tough time. But do you think that the average Nigerian thinks that we are a rich country? Why do we think that? And, and what role is the government playing in, in that false, falsehood in closing? 
Well, uh, like you said, the same poor education that is what is making people uh, say, and I would have expected that Andy Farasi that was British educated, came from a rich home, having run a church for God knows how long, and, uh, uh, and uh, has prospered within the system to properly educate the people as to the fact that, and I always said it, maybe, I've, always, I've, I've seen your program before and I was attacked. Nigeria is not a rich country. And the unfortunate thing is that we expect so much from Nigeria, so much so that we don't understand Nigeria is not a rich country. Mm. We are talking about wrong education, yes. What is the cost? What, what is your contribution to education? This is a country where we expect free education. And of course, even at the university level, it's a free education we have in this country, talking of the government universities. So how do you, how do you want to measure up with a British university system where you pay 9,000 pounds as a citizen? It used to be three before, um, before um, David Cameron make it uh, 9,000 pounds. So how do you measure up? So, 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 so the Nigeria is a poor country, truly. Unfortunately, the aspect of corruption has covered, has, has ever has completed the fact that this is why we are poor, corruption is rife, and so people now look at the corruption angle of it to think that we are a rich country. Nigeria is a very mm -hmm. poor country. And that is where, you look at what's our GDP compared to our population. Yes, we are talking about our population is not correct, but even if you look at our GDP to population, mm -hmm. divide it. Nigeria sells 1.2 million barrels, 2.1 million barrels of oil per day. Okay, let's even show we are 150 million people. Divide, let's say the, the main source of income is, is oil. And we sell just about 2.1 million barrels per day. On the population of about, say, 150 million people, let's be, let, me be, let me come take 150 million. How much is that? Saudi Arabia sells 8 million barrels of oil per day, a population of about 30 million people. So I want to compare, and each time we make that wrong analysis and wrong comparison, and unfortunately, because government is not true to their words, because government does not have that moral background to really tell Nigeria, look, this is a poor country. They keep giving us false sense of hope. So today, we expect cheap fuel in Nigeria. We expect cheap fuel. Even the countries that are rich do not sell cheap fuel. But we expect everything free. And what's the contribution of the church? Look, I'm a Christian, and I want to talk about the church. We, we don't what's have time. Alasta, I'm, so I'm so sorry. Alasta, I'm so sorry. We're out of time. We're out of time. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. We have to go. Alasta, I'm so sorry. We have to go. Kule. Just in a sentence, because we were out, totally out of time. My guys are saying we have to go. Okay. When he spoke, of, when uh, Paul Adifarasi spoke about education, what's actually lacking in Nigeria is political education. How many of us have read the institution? I love the way the middle class just absorbs itself of responsibility of what it created. I think we can close with that. <laughs> okay. Well, I want to thank everybody. I know Ogwevere is a broadcast journalist. Kuni Lawal is of the Electoral College. And of course, um, Alester Wilcox is a political analyst. Thank you very much, lady and gentlemen, for being part of this conversation. Thank you. All right. Well, we'll take a thank short you. break. Thank you all for staying with us. When we come back, the House of Representatives takes a step to reduce defections in the political terrain of the country. How do they want to do that? We'll tell you when we come back.